Okay, Greg Walls is my guest today. He was a guitarist in Anthrax for a couple of years in the early days, and then he later played with Stephen Piercy as well. And he's got some very interesting stories, and he's a very colorful storyteller. And we're going to talk about his time in Anthrax, the New York rock scene, what he did after Anthrax, and what he hopes to do for the future. All this and more coming right up. Well, first of all, welcome to the show, Greg Walls. Thank you. Founding, yeah. uh, do you call it, do you count as a founding Anthrax guitarist or early Anthrax guitarist? I'm not sure what you put uh, I mean, look, I, I met Scott probably when he was 16. We were working at Toys R Us, and uh, <laughs> um, that's where I met him. And, uh, you know, uh, I mean, he was doing nothing. It was just him and Danny Lilker, and he had a place in the music building in Jamaica, Queens. And I started playing with them after a while. Uh, but I mean, it was just a couple of kids and his brother was 14 and his brother was singing. And the first gig we played was um, uh, the North Stage Dinner Theater and it was in Glen Cove. And, and I think Iron Maiden played the day before and Joe Perry played after that. So it was like it was a big venue. And I don't know how he booked that, but, you know, he was a rich kid. He paid for everything, this guy. He really did. So, so, um, but, uh, you know, I couldn't play with his brother. I, t I, I just told him, I said, look, I'm not going on stage with your 14-year-old brother again. I'm not doing this again. I, I, I so, so I knew Greg D'Angelo and Scott hated Neil Turbin like crazy. I think it was because of a girl at school or something. And uh, so, but. I had to so much convince him to take Neil Turbin and Greg D'Angelo had this amazing drum set like Tommy Aldridge. He came from a very rich family also. Him and Scott both had a lot of money. And he had this insane drum set, double kick set with the big bar going around and all this. I mean, he had, and it, I said, we're going to look impressive if we get this drum set up on stage, you know? So I, I got those guys. Uh, I knew them and uh, really... I mean, I really put it together into a professional situation. I mean, even Scott was using Scott Ian Rosenfeld. And I said, why don't you just use Scott Ian? Scott Ian Rosenfeld. I said, you know, it's it's it sounds like, uh, I don't know, it sounded like a, the corner store, Rosenfeld. So, um, you know, uh, to me, he said, no, I don't want to do that. My mother wants me to keep my name. But and he ended up doing it. Yeah. So all of the things, you know. I mean, it, it started to started to propel the band into a a more uh, um, professional kind of a mode. If it if it wasn't for me, they would be still picking their nose playing a uh, Black Sabbath, you know, which you can hardly <laughs> play to begin with. Well, yeah. So, so I've heard yeah. the I've heard a lot of these. Uh, the you say the story before I had some I had some questions about it. First of all, so you worked with him at Toys R Us. Why did he work at Toys R Us if he was so rich? Like, why his parents made him do it or something? You know, or just something for fun? He, or I think so. Absolutely. Uh, um. You know, I could tell you, there's something I, I'm dying to tell everybody that I don't want to say because I don't know legally where I would be. But his father was a jewelry manufacturer, but he did something else also on the side. And he had a cigarette boat. I mean, do you know how much a cigarette boat cost in 1980? I mean, it was hmm. a cigarette boat. Those are racing boats. They're like, no. back in the day, they were $150,000 boats. They were long, long, no. you know, so... And he lived on the water in the South Shore of Long Island. So Scott, I mean, Scott showed up with amazing, expensive guitars every week, a different guitar. He bought all of Kiss's equipment when they came off the tour. It was beaten to shit, but it looked impressive. And we had a wall of Marshalls that said Kiss on it. I mean, it was insane. The money him and Greg D'Angelo had. Greg D'Angelo's father also had a lot of money. He had a car collection. He had a Shelby Mustang. And he, he had tons of Corvettes. The kid was driving a Corvette at 18. Both of these guys had shit tons of money. And, you know, I could tell you stuff about White Lion, too. Forget I got stories. I got stories about everything that Greg told me. I, I tell you, I, I can't, you know, I got a, it's too blary here. Okay. So no, that's fine. And, yeah, and that's yeah, interesting. That, so, yes. Yeah, so his, his mom, his mom liked me and she was a nice lady. And I think she, she wanted to keep the the sort of Jewish tradition in his life and and he she even wanted us to play Hava Nagila at one time <laughs> but uh, I said no because then we're gonna play an Irish jig and my mother's from Iran so 
But uh, no, I, yeah, he, he I, it was working for his father in Manhattan in the jewelry uh, manufacturing business. Yeah. And he did offer me a job at one time. But I mean, he was getting paid like, I, I mean, I was a poor kid, grew up, up uh, on top of a store in a bar in Queens. I didn't see money like this. It was insane. I was driving this rust bucket. I had no money, you know, so uh, uh, it was sort of shocking to me that, but he, 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 I mean, even when we went to John's Zazula's, he used to blow thousands of dollars. He had a little record um, store in New Brunswick, New Jersey, in the, in the flea market, John's Zazula. So, I mean, he did this, even Scott told me, um, if I'm talking too much, let me know. <laughs> even Scott <laughs> told me, he told me that he used to buy uh, uh, scalpers tickets way back in the day when they were two, three thousand dollars, which is like a billion dollars today. He used to sit front row dead center for every fucking concert because he wanted these people to know his face. That's the kind of thinking he had. So wow. I said, I thought this guy, he's going to do something because at least, you know. Yeah, so why do you think he was so, why was he so driven? I mean, usually like kids that have a lot of money, you know, they'd go into the right. family business or something. Like, why was he so right. motivated to do music or something? Was it? I, I think that he, he really looked up to all of the rock stars like I did and everybody else. And mm -hmm. he loved all the horror movie stuff. And um, I think it was probably some deep seated dream that he wanted to do, which I wanted to do, too. That's all. I, I ate shit and did nothing else but guitar and rock and that was the only thing i could think of and and you know i'm 102 and i'm still like that so uh you know <laughs> but um i think that's what it is you know and so yeah the other thing i i was wondering about was because that was the other thing with the money is that you know you say he had a lot of money but then you said he never paid you guys or something so like when oh, you think no, if you had money no. what wouldn't he pay oh, you guys I, I really gave well it to the guy for the lights i gave it to the guy for the truck oh i gave it to and here i am not going to college not getting a job putting all my time into helping this guy get more and more professional looking and giving him great ideas, writing songs for him. And then, you know, a couple of years down the line, I'm like, what the fuck am I doing? At least I woke up, thank God. But, uh, I mean, you know, this is how it went. And I, I, I don't know. <laughs> so were you still working other jobs during that time when you were in anthrax? Like, cause if you weren't getting paid for anthrax, you had to be doing other stuff. I was pumping gas. I had long hair down in here. You know, I still do. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, I was pumping gas and uh, getting spit on by people with fortunes and great necks. But yeah, that's what I was doing. So, so that's uh, kind of what motivated you to go to college because you didn't you didn't see a future with the band. Exactly. Exactly. Because I saw how he was really what he was doing. And he was really uh, the guy was a was a savvy businessman, but a bastard. He was just using every walking on top of everybody's head. You know, I even was friends with Danny Lilker, and even after I left Anthrax, I used to go to his house and hang out with him. And, you know, he threw him out. I know Danny really, when we tried to record, Danny was not being able to play a steady note for the, for the backbone of the of the uh, recording. And the engineer was telling us, this guy, he it, it's not steady what he's playing. I, we, I can't record with this guy. So that was the beginning of the problem with him. And... um you know, uh, so uh, what'd you ask me? Yeah. How did, well, how did he get, how's the other question I had about, because you said when you joined, um, you guys changed singers and his brother was the original singer. How did you right. get him to fire his brother? And is his brother, I mean, they're still on good terms. He wasn't bitter about it or anything. Uh, well, you know, I haven't, uh, well, one day, uh, one day I saw his brother on Francis Lewis Boulevard in Queens, which is like a place where everybody went to meet girls and drag their cars. He pulled up next to me, and it was about a year later after I left, and he said, Greg, I just want to tell you that Scott made his first million dollars with Fistful of Metal. And I said, really? How many millions of dollars did he spend to make that one million? Because I knew what was going on. That's what was going on. You know, when there's a mural of Scott on Hollywood Boulevard, on uh, Sam Ash or Guitar World, he pays for everything. That's how this guy is. I mean, he's not a supermodel. And he's not a, an amazing guitar player. <laughs> I mean, this is what he was doing. But, you know, but I just wanted to tell you, you know, Fistful of Metal was completely written before Charlie Benante and Spitz and Bello or any of these guys were ever even on the horizon. We were at 120 West 31st Street, which was a block off of Madison Square Garden in a recording studio. Ross the Boss was there. 
uh, Judy Chase, which is now his wife. She was a kiss at. She was there. My girlfriend, Lynn Kosminski. There was a lot of people there. Neil used to come down once in a while. We were recording rhythm tracks, me and D'Angelo. And, and uh, you know, um, Ross the Boss came into my room where I had the Marshall stack. And he turned it up to 10. And it was like, <laughs> what the fuck are you doing? He's like, it's rock and roll, man. I got to notice this fucking fees back. I can't do anything with this noise. Yeah. But we were recording it there because it was completely written. Okay. So I don't know. Okay. This is where the issue came out when they came out with this documentary of the history without Greg Waltz. If I didn't have that little video, those two videos I have of me yeah. as a kid playing with them, nobody would blame me probably. Yeah, so explain that because I, I think I, I heard your demo, which uh, the first demo, and it has the songs Hate, Pestilence, Satan's Wheels, and Across the River and Howling Furies. You said Across the River and Howling Furies was already written before you were in the band. Um, so yeah. why was it uh, the songs you said you said you wrote Panic and Metal Thrashing Mad um, right. and some of the other stuff? Why wasn't that recorded in that first demo? Was that not they didn't think it was as good then or was it recorded? Was it written after that demo? Oh, it was written after that demo. Oh, okay. yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. OK. Yeah. So, and then, we, so Lula wanted us to play I'm 18. And Scott wants to suck everybody's dick and appease everybody, of course. So that's what he did. And I told there was so many other songs I wanted to play, but and Neil also too. We were kind of fighting with him, but I said, "All right, let's play that song," you know, whatever. And uh, so yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I talked to a lot of these guys online, and Charlie Bonante blocked me because I said, "Can I ask you something?" After that documentary came out, I think it blew the top of my head off because all these years I got on with my life. I've been flipping foreclosures. I'm a millionaire in real estate. I've, I, I, I'm I fine. I've been doing everything that, you know, I want to do. I played with Stephen Piercy and all kinds of shit. But that blew the top of my head off because also, you know, Scott, he wrote a few books and he was doing a book signing. He was doing a book reading because, you know, I don't know who he thinks he is. He's he's Hemingway, I guess, with the cats. I don't know. And and, and he was in some uh, um uh comedy um place in uh la cienega boulevard uh in la and i heard it on the radio i was with my girlfriend i said you know what let's go down there so i got down there i told the guy at the door it was like as big as a building all the the uh security guys he had he said okay okay come in you don't have to pay sit in the back i sat in the back i listened to him he's telling stories and bullshitting whatever he's doing and then at one point he turned the lights up and said anybody have any questions and I walked down the thing and I said, when's the last time you saw Greg Walls? And I still had a good attitude, to tell you the truth. I did have a good time with him. He was a smart guy. I mean, we had a good sense of humor. We were always laughing and joking around. But he was a son of a bitch behind all of that. You know, he would stab you in the back while you're not. So I hugged him on stage and talked to him in front of everybody. And I and he said, uh, I can't believe it's you. It's, it's really you. Turn the lights up. I can't see you. And he goes, oh, I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I, I, you're in the book. You're in the book. And I said, what is he acting like this for? I mean, there were 300 people there. A lot of people saw it online. They, they wrote to me. And I started saying, boy, this motherfucker, he really thinks he fucked me over good, this motherfucker. Why is he so bent out of shape? He, he stopped the show. He couldn't do the show anymore. He walked outside and started. To, it was a line, and he's signing books. I walked through the line, started talking to him, and he's like, "Going through the book. Let me find him. You're in a book. Look, you're in a book." I go, "Oh yeah, I'm wearing your jacket, man." And I started talking to him. I said, "Life is crazy, man. I, you know, isn't this nuts?" And I gave him my number. I said, "Look." And Pearl was there, his wife. And I said, "I got my girlfriend." I said, "Why don't we go out to dinner? I'll buy you dinner sometime, man. We'll talk or whatever." Never heard from him again. And I started thinking, you know. This motherfucker knows what he did. He knows what he did. And in my opinion, when he put all, all those other guys' names on there by being generous to share his songs with everybody, he was spreading the crime. So if I fucking did something, there's now there's five people against me. Hmm. Interesting. He's, not, he's no dummy. You know, yeah. I'm sorry. I had cataract surgery. So anyway. <laughs> No. So, yeah. So explain that you, you uh, said that you wrote uh, metal thrashing mad and panic the riffs and then Neil, the singer at the time, I wrote, wrote metal thrashing the mad, that whole song, uh, uh, not the lyrics, but I wrote that song complete and uh, a panic. I wrote complete except for the, the double lead part. That's it. Danny mm -hmm. wrote the double lead part. That's it. 
So, you think that, cause I don't know how that works. So I've never been in a band or in the music business. Like, did he just maybe, did he forget? Did he uh, just oh, think no. well, you're not in the band? So you're not a part of like, did he not realize you know, I that? Tell you, I have a big mouth now. I wasn't like that when I was 18. And I, I came out of a heavy, horrible kind of family with a lot of substance abuse and alcoholism and a lot of abuse for me. I was the only kid in that family with a bunch of adults who were out of their minds. And I did not speak up for myself. And I didn't say anything. I took abuse from everybody. And I didn't say, anything. okay, whatever. But, you know, because um, people ask me, why didn't you do anything? Because they come from a nice family. They don't understand what, what it was going on. I was throwing up and I had diarrhea all the time because I was a monkey in a cage getting poked with a stick. And I was, you know, being being heavily abused. So people don't get that, you know. Uh, um, and that's what my issue was. And that's why I didn't say or do anything about it. And I just kind of pushed it away and went to college and tried to do what I could. But it bothered me all my life. But when they came out with this thing, that really bothered me. And, and you know, many people have told me that I won't even mention because they're, they're known. Many people, even, you know, even I met recently Danny Spitz, who, who not Danny Spitz, Dave Spitz, the, the bass player who was in Black Sabbath, who's Danny's brother. He doesn't like his brother. And he told me shit, you know. Uh, I mean, they all had my Anthrax uh, Rip Me Off video on their phone when I met them at uh, in Deerfield Beach at the uh, Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp recently. And uh, I talked to Mustaine. I gave him my number. I said, listen, <laughs> I said, listen, I love what you did. I think I think it's amazing. You got kicked out of it, um, Metallica and came back, in my opinion, with a band that's even stronger, more more amazing musicians. And I said, if Kiko ever leaves, please call me. Please go. I'm a workaholic and I'm a maniac. I'm not interested in girls or money. I'm just interested in playing with you. So, you know, but I, all these guys had my shit on their phone. They came up to me like this and I was laughing. They all knew what was going on. So yeah. they might not say it because a lot of these guys are safe. They have a good, good career going. They don't want to rock the boat. But a lot of these people knew what was going on. And I was kind of at least it made me feel good. You know, yeah. well, do you think, though, but I guess my point was, do you think that Scott do you think he just thought like, oh, it doesn't really matter. Like no one's going to like, this isn't going to sell a bunch of copy. Like he didn't, pro he probably didn't think we're going to be talking about this album 40 years later. Like he probably just thought like, ah, just give the credit to Charlie and, and uh, Dan and all, and just give it to everybody. I, don't who cares. Know at all. I know his personality. He's not that type of guy. Uh, if it was, ah, it's no big deal. He would have, he would have eventually included me. Oh, what I was going to say was um, all of these people, a lot of people have told me, um, Shit, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> when you get old, what happens? Yeah. <laughs> um, I can do this, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, do you think that... Um, now I forgot what I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> this is great. This is great. Great, great uh, radio here, podcasting. Um, yeah, do you think... So how do you make peace with this? I guess that's my question now. Because now, like I said, it's been 40 years. How can you bury the hatchet with Scott? I mean, you went on YouTube and made it very public... And you yeah. gave him your number. He never called you. So, I mean, do you think if you guys sat down either maybe on my show or in private or something, do you think you could bury the hatchet with him? Like, what would you, would you want him to admit that he, that it was your I nice to him. I tried being nice to him at that show, at that comedy show. Yeah. And uh, he didn't call me and ran away. You know, it would, it would have been so easy. I mean, look, I've been playing guitar for 52 years. I'm a fucking monster. And if he's used so many different people, he could have said, Hey, I would have done it for nothing even. I shouldn't say that out loud. But uh, <laughs> he should have said, why don't you play with us for a tour? Or why don't you play? But, I mean, to, to at least make amends for what he did. I know what he did. And he's a son of a bitch. He's, I, I believe he's like a fucking narcissist sociopath that doesn't give a fuck about anybody. He even fucked over Danny Lilker, his best friend. He, that's the kind of guy he is. He did the same thing to his brother. I mean, this is the kind of guy he is. He'll he'll do anything it takes, including put some jeweled knee pads on and get on. I mean, this is how he is. So he is such so much of a a spotlight, uh, uh, you know, whore that you remember Married with Children when they were on that show. Yeah, he takes Joey Belladonna, a singer like that who's great, and puts him on the couch with a fucking tambourine, and Scott sang on the show because he wanted the fucking spotlight. I thought that was so humiliating what he did to Joey. I said, 
who the fuck would even stay in a band or talk to him after that? I mean, I'm playing the tambourine. That's what I do in a band. And I sit here like an idiot. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the kind of person he is. That shows everybody right there to me, in my opinion, what kind of person he is. Yeah, but you don't want to hold on to that anger. Like, how do you how do you move forward from that? Well, the thing is that he stole my fucking songs and he copyrighted my shit and made, um, I don't know how many millions of dollars. And you know what? I just saw a Jackson um, kind of little clip he did for Jackson guitars. He's playing Metal Smashing Red. 40 years later, he's still playing. So when he goes to sleep at night, he knows Greg Wills. Well, I talked to even John Cezula before he died. John Cezula said, listen, dude. If, if, if you're telling me that's I, I goes, I got to tell you, that's their best song. That's what he said to me. Wow. And, and, you know, and he was very nice to me in the end. And I, he had the same kind of a childhood I had. And he was very cool. Maybe he knew he was dying, but he was awesome with me, to me. Yeah. And I, I, you know what it is? It's, it's that I feel like I was used and abused. I was, I was, he ripped me off. What he did was a crime and it was fraud. And on top of that, you know, after all these years, then they come out with this this documentary that doesn't mention me. Now, I was going to say, all of these people that are well-known, what they said to me in the side was, he did that because the lie has been going on for so many decades. He can't come out and say the truth now. That's what I wanted to say before. He oh, can't. okay. He painted himself into a corner, and now he's going to go, oh, by the way, uh, Greg was in the band. And, oh, really? He's going to do that now? He really can't. So truthfully, that's that's what what the deal is. Okay. You know? So you don't think he would ever publicly ad admit that, or do you think he would privately to you and say, "Yeah, that was your riff," and here's why I use. I don't know what the reasoning was why he didn't credit you, but I mean, he's probably afraid of a uh, camera from Project Veritas. I, I have no. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I mean, know you haven't he's... sued him, so I mean, either you think that you don't want to go that route and be aggressive like that, or you don't think you, you, that you could win the case because how can you prove it? It's his word against well, you. Well, look, the, the statute of limitations is five years, and oh, I okay. didn't do well. anything about it, and I tried to fucking not think about it and get on with my life, and it was a painful thing, and I took I took the fucking, you know, uh, wounds, and I took the gunshots and the arrows, and I said, all right, this is the way it went. But when they came out with that, with 20 shows and not one mention of me, and then even Neil Turbin, Neil Turbin actually called me on the phone. He made me so fucking mad. That's when I made that video. And it was a one shot thing. I didn't practice 12 times to do it. I just did that one shot thing because I couldn't take it anymore. Wait, what did Neil do that pissed you off? I don't remember. But when he talked to me, you know, he 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 said something that uh, made me angry that uh you know, because Neil wasn't there a lot of times when when we were practicing for Fistful of Metal to record it, we were getting together two hours before Neil would get there. Some days he wouldn't even get there. It was just the Greg D'Angelo on drums and Danny Luker, Scott and me. We would practice to get tight to record this album. So we used to get there. And the thing is that when I showed him all of these riffs and all of the songs. I didn't say, hey, Neil, that song we just played is mine. And Scott wouldn't say anything. He'd just mm -hmm. smile and wink at me. And like a dope, I didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. And I, as a kid, I was, I, I was, you know, I can't really blame myself because this is how, how I was. And I just trusted people and thought, you know, oh, well, I'll be on the album. They'll write my name on it because it's the right thing to do. What are you fucking kidding? The world doesn't work like that, Gregory. Yeah. So you you kept all that in and then you finally let it out with the YouTube. And how did that feel? And, and what kind of I mean, because I read the comments and most of the comments were really positive. Did anyone reach out to you, other members of Anthrax or anybody else? No, no, of course not. I, I saw Danny. Somebody sent me a link to Danny talking to some gigantic fat pig. He was eating donuts. <laughs> Who is this? Greg Waltz? What is he saying? Who does he think he is? And that I read in Scott's book. Well, that's your fucking problem, you idiot. You're at Scott's book. I mean, you know, I was there. It's my life. These eyes, this nose, and these ears smelled it and listened to it. And I lived it, son. You know, I don't know what you're talking about, pal. So that, I mean, look, 95% of the people said nice shit. I turned the comments off because people are more interested in, uh, is, or is, it, is his teeth fake? Is that his hair? I mean, this is where they go. Like, hey, fucking, 
I could be your fucking great grandfather. I'm better looking than you'll ever be. I go look at these guys' <laughs> pictures. They're 20 years old. They're big fat slobs with a little half a beard. It looks like they were eating shit in prison. I mean, that's what got me mad. And I said, I don't need this shit. I don't need these guys to gang up on me. Fuck you. So I turned the comments off. Uh, and uh, that was it. But a lot of people did say nice shit to me. And, and uh, yeah. Uh, have, you, have you ever thought of doing, like, stand-up comedy? You're pretty damn funny. Like. <laughs> Yeah, no. I actually I did do stand up comedy. Did you uh, really? Yeah. Paralyzed on Broadway and a few places, stand up New York and Manhattan. And, okay, yeah, because yeah, you said, I saw the video and then you sent me this like 10 minute clip. And uh, I didn't really, I saw a 10 minute clip from you. I'm like, 10 minutes? I was like thinking that was so long. At the end of the 10 minutes, I was like, no, keep going. I want to hear more. That's why I was like, I got to have this guy on the show. Like, you're such a great storyteller. Like, it's entertaining, it's colorful, you know? Podcast? No, I like, say. <laughs> Yeah. So talk about like, um, I know, I mean, obviously, you know, you're bitter towards Scott and, and rightfully so, but uh, talk about the good times that you guys did have when you were in the band back in the scene right. in New York music. There, there, you had some good stories. You were hanging out with Metallica. Was yeah. there other uh, New York music scene people that you came in contact with during those years? Uh, yeah, there was a ton of them. I really don't remember a lot of stuff, but, but, um, uh, every once in a while, I remember certain things here and there more than I usually remember, you know. Um, but uh, it was kind of cool, you know, when Metallica first, uh, I probably said this on other things, but uh, when mm -hmm. Metallica first came yeah. to New York from, uh, you know, San Francisco, I was there three hours early because that's the kind of guy I was in, in the music building. And they were on top of us on the fifth floor. We were on the fourth floor and they came into the room. And it was just the, the four of them. It was Burton and Mustaine and Hatfield and Lars. And, um, you know, I used to make these guys laugh all the time. And I would talk like this. And I would, <laughs> I was always doing something. What are you talking about? You know, I was driving them nuts and they all laughed and, and they all liked me. They were all cool. And, yeah. um, but, but they told me, you want to come upstairs and hear a set. And they didn't have vocals or anything. They just played through their marshals in the little fucking room. And I was sitting there and I was like, uh oh. I was like, these guys are really tight. We sound like a fucking garage band. And I'm telling you, you know, with Milker on bass and, and Scott playing, he was horrible. He never practiced. Greg D'Angelo used to yell at him all the time. He's like, you got to fucking practice. You're always fucking out uh, driving around and going to drive throughs You got to you got to put some work in this by a metronome. But, you know, so it, that, 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 it, when when Scott and the band and everybody came after I saw them play a set, I said, Metallica's upstairs. And, I, and you know, I didn't know from Metallica who did. You know, I, I, it was John Sazula's thing. And I met them. They were cool. And, you know, I was joking around with them. I said, you know, uh, so you're from San Francisco. You know what I hear about San Francisco? He goes, oh, yeah? Well, what about the village? I'm like, okay, all right. You know, and then they, they were going to go upstairs. And I said, listen, these guys are very fucking tight. Don't take it lightly. And they went upstairs. They came back. And Scott. He, we, he said, let's play for them now. And they came downstairs. He picked one of the most embarrassing, baby shitty songs that he wrote. I don't know, Hunting Dogs or something. Oh, it's so embarrassing. I said, no, let's not play that. Let's play, the, let's play anything but that. And he said, oh, no, 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 let's play that. And it was the shittiest. And I felt so embarrassed after seeing them. And I was downstairs with them. And I was like, listen, I don't want to get fucking humiliated. We got to do better than this. Cause I'm playing with a bunch of schmucks here, you know? So that's, that's my first uh, thing with Metallica. But I mean, we were hanging out with them all the time. We used to get in Greg D'Angelo's van and go buy beer or go buy it. You know, I'll tell you something though. I never did. I never did drinking or drugs or, or smoked because my family was. Really? You know, so well, yeah, I knew up. about your family background, but so you never didn't even ha when you were hanging out with all these guys, you were t dead sober. Yeah. Maybe wow. that was the problem. Oh, no, that's interesting because see, I thought, I thought about that. Like, I'm sure you, I know you have some regret of like, if you had stayed with the band, but I thought you staying with the band could have been a disaster because I think so. background, I don't think you would have been ready for the road and all. And maybe you were right. sober then, but maybe yeah. eventually you would have fell prey to uh, drugs or, I mean, you could be dead. Right. And because that's, I never did it. That's why I'm so beautiful at 73. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, and you still made millions in real estate, right? Is that what you do? Right. Yeah. Right, so right, maybe right. everything worked out for you. Yeah. But you know what, though? I never quit playing the guitar and I got better and better and better. And now there's YouTube 
When I was a kid, there was a record. You put the needle on there to try it. What did he do? I can't figure it out. Now they're showing you. Here's what I did. Yeah. Slow it down for you. So I am getting better and better. I have that fever in me. It's just who I am. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I did this little EP with Mark Stein. He sang on it from uh, Vanilla Fudge. You know, I, I, I'm still doing, I'm, I'm trying to get something together. I did talk to him, Stain. I saw him, you know, not too long ago. So maybe seven months ago or something like that. So, uh, and I did play with uh, Piercy Pierce, after yeah. that. I, you know, I, I moved to LA in 2010 and did that. Did you, when so, you were in college, did you play like on the weekends and stuff? Or did you try to start another band after that? Uh, you know, when I went, I went to three different colleges. I got a, I have a BS in finance, but what happened was I kept, I kept quitting to play in bands. And I was in a band called, I just shouldn't even say the name of that band. I don't even want to give them any any fucking PR at all. They were horrible. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I played with a couple of bands here and there. Yeah, I You did. remember, uh, um, speaking back of the New York scene, do you remember a band called uh, Steel of Fortune? Because Matt Fallon, he's kind of an interesting case too. He later went on to be the singer of Anthrax briefly and then later uh, the singer of Skid Row. And so I just wonder if you ever you know, have any interactions with him. No, it doesn't sound familiar at all. Uh, and the name of the band doesn't either to me, so. Okay, or Twisted Twisted Sister was big back then in New York, right? Yeah, 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 definitely. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I, I mean, I saw the whole thing with Kirk, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dave Mustaine leaving and crying, and they, he went to Danny Lucas' house and took a shower and got on a bus, and you know, I thought this guy's never going to come back with anything, and then, and then they didn't have a guitar player for a long period of time, and probably two or three months is, is what I remember. And, um, you know, I, I just, hey, Greg, hey, hey, what's the matter with you? What's the matter? You know, wake up. You know, I just, I don't know. I, I, I wish I was the guy I am now back then. Uh, you know, she's Metallica doesn't have a guitar player and, and you play guitar. Oh, Jesus. You know, I, I really, I talked to Sasula about that too. But, um, but I, I played with Kirk Hammond out of my little practice amp, my PV backstage, because we played with them. And Kirk Hammett, but guitar players hate each other, and he did not like me. I could tell he didn't like me. Hmm. You know, jealous or whatever. He's got a little babyish kind of nonsense. But uh, uh, Burton was a very uh, serious guy and always looked like a mean guy. But I used to make him laugh. I used to make that guy laugh too. And and inside he was a sweetheart. He looked like he like this on the outside, but he was a sweet guy. And I I, I love the guy. I feel bad about what happened, but um. I mean, I, you know, I saw both guitar players. I thought Dave Mustaine was a great guitar player. I think he's intelligent. He hires guys like Marty Friedman and amazing Chris Broderick. I mean, he's humble enough and smart enough to go, I'm going to get guys even better than me. That's an intelligent guy. Instead of going, I want to be the guy on the microphone on Married with Children and put the, you know. So I really respect that, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, have you seen what he said recently? He was saying some stuff, like he's still mad about Metallica, how they use some yeah. of his songs, and the he's mechanic. still kind of bitter about that, even though he's yeah, gone on to huge success with Megadeth. Like the Four Horsemen and the Mechanic, which is yeah. his song. It's the and, same uh, I think song. It was Ride the Li- one of the songs, I think, was it Ride the Lightning? I think that song was co-written by him, too. Yeah. Yeah, a couple yeah. songs on that album. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. They, they, you know. But the thing is that he at least, you know, he did something. You can't. You know, he's driving an Aston Martin and married to a model. So uh, you said you're driving an Escalade. You, you did really well with real yeah. estate. I have three TVs in it, like Puff Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what is? So what? What made you uh, want to go into real estate? Was it just you wanted to get rich? You wanted to make money, or what well, drove you to do that? My, my aunts were huge in real estate, and they owned a they owned a place on Jupiter Island here when I was a kid. And uh, I made a key, unbeknownst to them, and I used to come down here all the time. Shh, it was right on the ocean. But uh, <laughs> uh, I I think um, I saw I it's gonna sound cheesy, but I saw a guy on real estate who had a tape system and a cheesy car car dealer mustache, used car dealer, and that's where I got the ideas from. Oh, you can go to the courthouse and read the cases and then read to see if it's the first mortgage and to see what to buy. And I started doing that. And I started, I mean, my first one was like, I put $50,000 into it, made 140,000. And then from 140,000, I made 400. And then it just, I kept going and going and going. So, uh, I mean, everything's fantastic about real estate. I mean, even uh, doctors and lawyers want to get in there for 
the tax reasons and everything else. Yeah. So, uh, well, no, because I, I don't know if you know, you know, like uh, the singer of the original singer of LA Guns, Paul Black, and I think one of the members of Vixen. I, I'm told that they are both doing real estate now, and they're making way more than they would make in in their respective bands. So I think that's yeah. like real estate. You can make a lot more money. Than a lot. I mean, unless you're at that again, Metallica or Motley Crue level or playing stadiums, you probably make more in real estate. Yeah. And you know something? The music business, because there's eight billion guys who play guitar who want that spot, they're willing to kill or suck a dick or I don't care what it is. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. So they really abuse and use people. I mean, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to give you a little. Greg D'Angelo from White Lion, you know, he was in Anthrax with me. Uh, the sh the stories he told me, I'm not going to say, but they're fucked up. I mean, um, he didn't get treated good, and he blew a lot of his own money going around the world. I don't think they, they treated him like a piece of garbage. So, I mean, you know, that's what goes on. I, I mean, you know, the uh, when I played with uh, – what. What the fuck? I'm going <laughs> to say a little of everything. When I played with Steven Piercy, the guitar players got Eric uh, uh, Ferentos. Yeah. You know, on stage, I could tell everybody loved me. But the minute I plugged in, guess who hated me? Eric Ferentos. And we're playing in the end of the night. I played in the little circuit with them in L.A. and, uh, you know, the Rio in, in uh, uh, Las Vegas and around. Eric was so pissed that i was there and wanted to don't, don't let him play any leads oh you know this is the kind of shit i had to deal with all my life he takes the guitar he broke a string it during round and round in the end the last song put the guitar over his head like an axe and this guy he's like gigantic like the hulk came running towards me ah! like this on stage in front of everybody and you know what because i'm fucking nuts i stood there and didn't move <laughs> i said I hope he hits me. I'll sue all these bastards. What was he so mad about? And then he, he stopped and he goes, eh, you're too loud. And then Stephen Pierce, he walked off stage. He didn't see that because huh. he wasn't able to play guitar anymore because he broke a string and he put the guitar down and then he put it over his head and ran. And, and in backstage, he was talking to Stephen and said, yeah, he, yeah, he did that on purpose. He, he turned the amp off. And I didn't touch anything. I didn't touch anything. But, you know, being honest, doesn't get you anywhere in this business. Wow. It's balls you're licking. And, you know, that's that's how it is. That's why, yeah, it's real estate better with all the shark lawyers and all. Yeah, it is. <laughs> well, so, okay, so what is the future that you want to do for music now? I mean, you have, I saw, I heard some of the walls of sound stuff that you yeah. put on your YouTube. That's cool. Is there, are you going to continue with that or do you want to do another project? No, I tell you, I want to do something heavier and, and, um, uh, I, I'm living in a one horse town. It's a rich, beautiful area here. It's like fucking paradise. Um, and, uh, but it, you know, I'm in the, I'm, I'm in the middle of nowhere. There's nothing here. You know, if you want to go to the guitar store and buy a fucking ukulele and a banjo, that's about all of it. That's, there's nothing, there's no music scene here. So, is this in New York you know, or where, where is this? No, this is, uh, it's Florida, Jupiter, oh, Florida. Jupiter, Florida. Florida. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I mean, Kid Rock lives here. I see, I see Tiger Woods at CBS. You know, um, you know. Wow. So, uh, it's awesome, but uh, for the music business, it's not going to get me any. I'm still in touch with people in Las Vegas and and Nashville, and uh, you know, uh, Stephen Pierce he wanted me to come out to Las Vegas. He said, "Why don't you come out and hang and whatever?" But you know, I, I, I don't know what's going on in my life. Maybe because I'm older. And I'm just, uh, you know, I had a girlfriend that died of cancer on November 2nd, and she died in like a month. And, and you know, it changed my head with everything. And I, 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 I'm I, probably burning bridges and telling people stuff. And I told Stephen what happened with Eric, and he uh, wasn't too happy about it. So, Shit. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear about your girl. I saw that on Instagram. I was like, uh, yeah, came out yeah. of nowhere, it seems like. Sorry to hear that. I mean, beautiful at uh, my age, but young looking. And she had muscly legs because she was a dancer. She used to teach little girls dance and uh, uh, just a really great person too. Full of life and loved life and was always happy, big smile, sweetheart. And uh, just she was diagnosed um, like, uh, yeah, stage four cancer. And I think it was like a month and a half. And it accelerated in the last four weeks so quickly. I mean, she just 
died. It was just unbelievable. But I'm I'm glad she didn't suffer. It went from her lungs into her body, into her brain. She she just bought a new car. She couldn't see. I had to pick her up and take her to chemo. And the doctor said she had eight lesions in her brain. She said, Greg, I'm sorry. She's got 32 lesions. This is pointless. And I was like, oh, my God. So, yeah, that's I just sold her house for real estate. I have a license. I, I just uh, I, Thursday is the closing, actually. So in a couple of days. But, uh, yeah, just horrific. That's I mean, terrible. You know, you never know, you know. Yeah. So, well, but, you know. Life is crazy. Well, I mean, I think you're a really talented musician. I, I watched you play Thanks. guitar. You clearly can play. And I think you should do something with that. I mean, whether even if it's just yeah. for fun or whatever, I think you should do something. I mean, uh, there's yeah. a lot of people out there. You can, maybe you could do something uh, via like Zoom like this. Like you can write something and put together. I know a lot of people have made albums living in different cities. I mean, maybe playing right. live, obviously, That's you can get together, but you can make yeah. albums playing you know, in different I can, cities. I can get hooked up with somebody, uh, you know, uh, for sure. Um, and, uh, that's, that's my issue right now. Uh, I, you know, um, yeah, I, I would love to do that if I could. So very cool. Um, well, and I yeah, hope that I, you can somehow find peace with to the grave. You know what yeah. I mean? It's a no, 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 no. And I think that you need to find somehow we need to find peace with, uh, with Scott. I know you're mad at right. him and rightfully so. And I haven't, I've never talked to Scott. I don't know his side of the story, but uh, right. I'm a like middle child. So I'm always like trying to be like the peacemaker. And I was like, I need to, I want to make you guys friends again. I just think it's stupid. I'm an only child, so. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I'd just be curious to hear just to hear what he says about it. I mean, does he totally deny it? Does he admit some? Does he does he say I don't remember? Like, I don't know. I, don't know. I think he doesn't want to get into it. and I don't blame him. And why would he want to get into it at this point? He's got it made. And he's why would he want to, uh, you know, fuck anything he's got? Uh, up? I mean, you know, I've known so many people, you know, Tommy Boland from Warlock. I used to teach him guitar. And from he's he's the living Queens. I went to school with his brother. I mean, Steve Stevens played on my Les Paul in my basement with my friends. I mean, I knew so many people from the music business, and you know, everybody has done so well. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I would like to do something, and I think I'm talented enough where I could. I'm singing very good now, very high, and I can, you know. So I'm like, you know, okay, Greg, you've done all of this work. And now let's uh, put it into something. But I would love to, you know, so yeah. really. Okay, cool. Well, uh, we're putting it out there into the universe right now. Yeah. Maybe somebody sees this podcast or whatever. But uh, I'm yeah, keep... I'm in Florida. I'm yeah. sorry. That's <laughs> God, but it's, not no. it's awesome. We'll keep shredding. And then I always end uh, each episode promoting a charity. You had mentioned, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, something. Uh, Children's Bird Foundation. Children's Bird Foundation in Los Angeles. How, how do you know about that? I've never heard about that one. I uh, used to, uh, you know, I, I've been uh, really uh, sending them stuff for years because, uh, I mean, it started with the first video I saw of some uh, some kid, uh, some Arabic kid that uh, his father did some kind of honor killing and poured stuff on this kid and burned this cute little kid. And then from then on, I was like, holy shit, that's the worst thing I've ever seen. So I, it made me uh, definitely, uh, you know, give tributes to those guys, you know, so, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll put that link in the show notes, and then people should just follow you, what, on Instagram and YouTube? Anything else? Yeah, I'm on Facebook also. I'm banned because I put up a joke. <laughs> joke. I, I don't see how you can be banned. You're so pleasant. and. <laughs> hey, fuck you. Who are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. I think you're really funny. I think deep down you have a really good heart, and so I hope yeah. that – I wish you happiness. I hope we can get everything worked out. I'd love to see you. I'd love to turn on my Instagram or YouTube one day and see you yeah. making some amazing music because I think you've got yeah. me. Right. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Thanks yeah, so much for doing this, Greg. I'll get this episode. Yeah, thank soon. you. It was, it was a lot of fun. And I, I, I love your personality, too. Uh, it's great to know you. Okay. Anytime, you know, you can contact me. So Sounds cool. good. Yeah, we'll have you back. Thanks. See you later, Greg. You Bye -bye. got it. My thanks again to Greg Walls and our mutual friend, Renee, for helping set this up. Some great stories, and I got to tell you, because I'm sure some people will say he's full of shit, uh, but I believe him, and here's why. I've seen him tell a lot of these stories multiple times, and the stories never change. It's always the same thing. He wrote the music for Panic and Metal Thrashing Mad and had a hand in some of the others, and he's very consistent with that and other things that he said. Uh, liars are not good at being consistent because they make stuff up and they can't remember what lies they told 
before, and often the stories get more outrageous the more times they tell them. And I just don't see that with Greg. His stories are very colorful, but the, he, the, the facts don't change. And uh, I hope that he continues to make more music and uh, make sure to support him by following him on Instagram and YouTube. And you can support this show much in the same way on social media and YouTube. And thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Have a great day and shoot for the moon. 